Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. I am Pastor Lisa Dietrich, pastor at Fresno Lutheran Church, a congregation that is rural just outside of Cedar Falls, Iowa. And we welcome all of you to the ministries we have here. Um, if you have not all had a chance to do so yet, I would encourage you all to watch the ordination service online that is available to you. It was a lovely evening and a wonderful service. And those are just a special service. If you've never seen one before, I would encourage you to, uh, to watch that and watch it together as a family or with some friends. Um, we will celebrate the Sacrament of Holy Communion today, so I hope that each of you that are worshiping with us have picked up a communion um, set. If not, they're in the back there on the table, and I would encourage you to grab one of those. And if you are worshiping with us at home, I would invite you to pause the service at this time so that you can collect either bread and cracker or wine and juice so that you can celebrate the Holy Sacrament with us when we get to that point of the worship service. It is getting closer and closer to Vacation Bible School, so if you have not done so yet, please let Kim Farley know that you are willing and able and ready and excited to help with that. Um, you can get a hold of her on her cell or by email or even just letting us know in the office and we'll get a hold of her for you. Um, we would be happy to do that. We keep in our thoughts and prayers this morning. We're adding to our prayer list Mariah Ash. Mariah has torn her ACL and she will be having surgery um, this coming Wednesday. So we're, uh, we keep Mariah and the Ash family in our thoughts and prayers. It'll be a long recovery, um, at least six months of recovery of no sports for Mariah, which is not good for a girl that's so athletic. Um, that's going to be hard for her. So we will keep all of them in our thoughts and prayers as she, as she heals. Um, I'm going to invite you all to stand in just a minute and turn and wave to the camera. And the reason we're going to do this is we're going to wave and we're going to say, peace be with you. Um, I was with some of my family a week or so ago, and I was just joking and saying, hey, now all my children, remember, church is tomorrow. And my niece, who is an activities director in an assisted living home, said, no, it's not, Aunt Lisa. Church is on Tuesday. And it turns out that every Tuesday they gather and watch our worship service. So will you please all stand up for me for just real quick. You can do this. That's right. Now the camera's back there. So you all need to turn around. And you all need to wave and say together, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Awesome. Thank you very much. We are so glad that if you are watching us online, we are so thrilled that you are part of this faith community, and we want you to feel connected to us as well. So um, praise be for all of those who can gather, where, whether in person or virtually. I think that's all I have for announcements. So let's, um, we'd certainly want to invite you after uh, worship today into the fellowship hall for some time of refreshments and, and some fellowship time of, of uh, getting caught up with one another. That's an important ministry. So hope that you can stick around for a little bit for that as well. Let's take just a moment to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. begin our worship with the confession and forgiveness of sins. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sins. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. 
We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. gracious, God the Son who saved us, God the Spirit placed upon us, be with you all and also with you. In peace let us pray to the Lord.
O God, you are the tree of life, offering shelter to all the world. Graft us into yourself and nurture our growth, that we may bear your truth and love to those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Today's reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7 to 15. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable, according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may, may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance, as it is written, the one who had much did not have too much. The second reading is from Mark chapter 5, verse, starting with 21. Carolyn, stop for a minute. Um, for those of you who it might be easier for you, since we're going to walk through this scripture reading, it might be easier for you to grab the Bibles in front of you and turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 5. i give you a minute to do that. This is, um, there is so much in this story. In fact, there's a couple stories that are woven together this morning. And I want to carefully go through it because I think there is a lot that we can glean from this. So we're looking at Mark chapter 5, verse 21, and we're going to go to the end of this chapter. Okay? Are you ready? Give me a thumbs up. <laughs> All right. I saw at least a couple. All right, Carolyn. Um, if you want to start at verse 21, my dear. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him and he was by the lake. Okay, stop. We're going to stop in almost every verse. So we have Jesus, and he keeps going back and forth right now in Mark's gospel across the sea, and so now we're going back to the other side, and we know that there is this now a great crowd, just like there has been. Remember, there was such a great crowd even last week and the week before? It's not subsiding. This is a great crowd that is hanging with Jesus, no matter what side of the sea that he's on, whether it's the Jewish side or the Gentile side, he is swarmed by people. Remember, we're now only in chapter 5 of Mark's Gospel, and there is a huge following of Jesus. So people know clearly who this man is, and they come to see what it is that he is up to. Um, so let's take a gander at what is Jesus up to this morning. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly. Stop. My what do you know? Who do we have? What's the guy's name? Jairus. Okay, or Jairus, Jairus, whatever you want to say. Exactly, Jairus. Who is Jairus? What's his position? 
Exactly. You're exactly right on the nose. He's a leader in the synagogue. This is a man with a lot of power and a lot of leadership. Now, he's also a man, and we know his name. And that's important, right? Which also signifies just how darn important this guy is. Because we don't just say, oh, it's one of the scribes from the synagogue. It's one of these people from the synagogue. No, this is a man, a leader in the synagogue whose name is Jairus. Okay? And now this guy is coming to Jesus. Now keep in mind that the leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, they're not exactly coming to Jesus to look for help, right? They're looking at Jesus and they're stalking around in the background, looking to trap the man as soon as they possibly can. Why? Because he's stirring up a whole bunch of people and they're starting to get nervous about the things that are going on. They don't want an uprising. Nobody likes change, including all of us. We don't like change. Um, and so they're worried about the changes that might come forth from this Jesus figure. And so here we have this man from the synagogue. Okay, Carolyn. My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her. Stop. So what do you know? What's he got? A daughter. What's her problem? Point of death. She's at the point of death. His little girl is dying. His little girl is dying. I want you to think about that. How many of you have little girls? Even if they're grown little girls. How many have little girls who have little girls? Yeah. Would you, what would you do to make sure if your daughter was dying or your granddaughter was dying, what would you do? Would you stop at any length to get them help? Probably not, would you? You'd be willing to do it all, whatever it takes. And that's what Jairus is doing. He must be doing. He must be scared out of his mind. Why? Because he's coming to this rebel Jesus. And he's not doing it privately. Remember, Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the night because he's got questions for Jesus. Jairus doesn't do that. He comes in the middle of this crowd, in the middle of this swarm of people. Why? Because his daughter is at the point of death. Okay, go ahead. So that she may, so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. Okay, stop. So what's he want from Jesus? He wants him to heal his daughter, right? So you got to assume at this point, I'm just going to set my Bible down because it's really heavy. Um, you can assume at this point that Jairus has exhausted every possibility, right? He wouldn't come to Jesus if he hadn't gone through all the steps and procedures and things known to mankind at that time that would promote some sort of healing. So he's exhausted all of that and now his last hope, his last ditch effort, if you will, is to go to Jesus and say, I don't know what else to do. My girl, my baby is dying. If you come and you lay hands on her, you could heal her. It is his last ditch hope. Imagine what that feels like. I want you to carry that emotion of what that must feel like to have your baby barely alive and you don't know what else to do and you come to this man in front of a swarm of people begging, maybe you, maybe you, Jesus, can save my baby. Because that's what's going on here. All right, Carolyn. And a, loud, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now... Stop. So now what are we doing? They're going, right? They're on the way. Who all's going with them? The crowd. Are you going along to see this? Okay, let's imagine you're at Watermelon Days and there's a swarm of people all around all the watermelon there. Somebody comes in and says, oh my God, my baby's dying. And you, 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 you can make her well again. And everybody's like, whoa, what's going on here? And they're like, okay, let's follow this. We gotta see what's going on. Is this really gonna happen? This is a little weird. And they all go with because, now, you can say it's all because it's strange, but also these people are gathering because they've already heard these things about Jesus, right? They've already heard that he has the power to heal. He has the power to cast out demons. He has the power to make people well again. And so they're following because, hey, we hit the jackpot. We're going to see a miracle today. And so they go along so that they can see 
this little baby girl, however old she is, that she just might get healed. And, oh, the gossip train, because it is Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. Can you believe it? Let's see what happens. All right, Carolyn. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. Stop. What do you know? Okay, we got a woman, and she's doing what? Bleeding. She's bleeding. You're exactly right, Jane. What happened to our little girl? <laughs> she kind of got set aside, didn't she? On their way there, you know, they're trucking them along down the road, and then all of a sudden, you know, this big crowd is swarming around Jesus, and they're all walking together, and now all of a sudden, <laughs> set that story aside, we got a woman who's bleeding. What's this woman's name? We don't know. She doesn't have one, does she? What's this woman's problem? She's hemorrhaging. She's hemorrhaging. She's not just bleeding. We're not talking a cut on the finger here, people. We're talking hemorrhaging. She is gushing blood. Now, do you remember what happens? Women who gush blood? How often do they do that? Think about it. Once a month, right? Once a month, people. Women gush blood. But this woman has been doing it a long time. We're going to find out how long in a little bit. And the thing that we need to know that is in this time period, anybody who was bleeding, they were unclean. Unclean. They could not be around. In particular, women could not be around the men. They would go to a special place where they would do their bleeding. And then they would have their ritual baths so that they could be entered back into the circle, back into the tribe, back into the community, once they were made clean again in their ritual bath. Because if they touched somebody, because they didn't understand about blood and they didn't understand about all this, they were, of course, afraid that this could be contagious. And so, because blood was a symbol and represents all of life, if you're leaving, your life is leaving you, God forbid you would touch a man and his life would leave him too. And so that woman is incredibly unclean. This is really critical and important. All right. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. Stop. What do you know? She's poor. Why is she poor? She spent all of her money trying desperately to be cured, to have her life given back to her. Imagine what her life is like for 12 long years without ceasing. This woman has been bleeding. Now, if you are a woman who is bleeding, there is something that cannot happen to you. You cannot get pregnant. You cannot bear children. And in this day and period, and honestly, sometimes even in ours in which we live, you don't fit in and you don't belong unless you can bear children. And this woman for 12 years, not only is she carrying this weight of never being able to bear children, she's been bleeding nonstop for 12 long years. For 12 long years, she has been removed from her community, removed from her family, removed from the center of life, of even gathering at the well to grab water at the time of day when all the women gather. She has been excluded from all of that. You thought a pandemic for one year was incredibly difficult. This woman for 12 long years has been removed from her family, her friends, her society completely. And imagine then the weakness, the anemia that she is feeling, the tiredness of all the time, the exhaustion. And she has now exhausted everything she had trying desperately to find a cure. But not only has she not found a cure, she's gotten worse. Imagine all the tinctures. Imagine all the things they've done to try to help her. And it only made her worse. The bleeding grew. The pain grew. The seclusion got bigger 
and longer with each attempt. Go ahead. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Stop. What do you know? What does she do? She touches, right? She doesn't touch him. She doesn't touch his body. What does she touch? His cloak. His cloak. Even as some scriptures say, even just the, the hem, the very bottom. So imagine, if you will, she is sneaking through the crowd, crawling on the ground, <laughs> trying to writhe her way through so that she can just touch the hem. Just the hem. That's all she needs. She believes maybe, just maybe, this is her last ditch effort. We have Jairus, right? A man with a name. And he wants his little girl healed. A little girl who has no name, by the way. He wants her healed and he comes to Jesus, begging Jesus. And then we have this grown woman, no name, who's been bleeding for 12 long years, who sneaks through the crowd. Mind you again, she's bleeding. Imagine all the men in that crowd that she could potentially be contaminating. She knows her own brokenness. She knows that she's bleeding. She knows that she is risking condemnation from all the people in the crowd, and yet she finds a way to muster because it is her last ditch effort. It is her last ditch hope is to come to Jesus, praying that Jesus somehow, even if she just touches the hem, just the hem of his cloak, she might receive healing. She might get a chance to get life back in her. Life back into her community. Life back with her family. Life that she could have a living and make money again. Somehow she could be restored to life. Just like the little girl who was to the point of death. And by the way, we got the story of this woman. Don't forget, we got a little girl over here dying. Imagine what Jairus is feeling about now. If you were the father, if you were the mother of this child that's dying, and you have this massive crowd walking around Jesus, ever walk in a crowd before? The bigger the crowd, the slower the whole thing moves, right? If I was that mama, I'd be taking Jesus by the beard and pulling him along and say, let's go. But the crowd is slowing him down, and now, now we have this woman who's interrupted all of it. Imagine what Jairus is feeling, his anger. His frustration. How dare you stop for this unclean woman who is not even worthy in our scripture to have a name because she has no value. All right, Carolyn. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped. Stop. What do you know? She's healed like that. Immediately, Mark's favorite word. I love that about Mark. Everything is very quick in Mark's gospel. Immediately, she's healed. After 12 years, after everything she's tried, boom, done, healed. Leading stop, Jack. That's exciting. All she had to do was touch the hem. All right. <laughs> Sorry. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? Stop. Now what do you know? Jesus felt power, didn't he? Felt the power. He felt that power leave him, even though it wasn't his person. Remember, his body wasn't touched. Just the hem of his cloak. I can't reach the hem of my skirt. Just a little bit. You know, just that is all that is touched. But he feels his power go out of him, and he knows that somebody has touched him, that somebody has been healed. And then he turns to the disciples, turns to the crowd, and goes, oh, stop. Who touched me? Imagine the disciples looking at each other going, are you nuts? Are you kidding me? I mean, seriously, you are like swarmed by this crowd and you're wondering who touched you, who hasn't touched you at this point. But they don't understand exactly what has happened here. They're not aware that Jesus senses his power leaving him and that somebody has been healed. 
Okay. You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can... No, I read it. That's okay. They can hear it again. You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Okay. So the woman knows that it was her, right? Because she sensed that she was healed immediately. And Jesus asks again, who is it who touched him? And she comes, imagine her fear. She's been found out. She's been caught. She thought it's just, you know, nobody would have to know. Nobody would have to know that she'd been bleeding. Nobody would have to know. She could just go get a ritual bath, get her certificate that she was now clean, and just go back home. That's all she wanted. But now, all of a sudden, this becomes public because Jesus stops and Jesus says, who's touched me? And knowing that she's been found out, because she doesn't know anything other than the power of men, she goes before Jesus and she falls down. And she begs on him mercy when she tells him everything. Even far more than you and I know from Mark's gospel, she tells him everything of the last 12 years, what it's been like. All the things that she's tried, all the money that she's paid, all the sacrifices she's made, all the pain that she's felt. By the way, we have a dying baby yet. We have a dying child. Don't forget that. But we got this woman who's taking so much time, this woman who has no value, no name, who's bleeding. Okay, now she's healed. Can we move on, please? Imagine Jairus' feelings. Go ahead, Carolyn. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Stop. What do you know? The daughter died. Mind you, dead is dead. In the midst of all of this, in the midst of the crowd and this woman, yay, she was healed, good for her. I am excited for her. I can't imagine what this woman has gone through. We should all feel joy for this woman. But can you imagine what Jairus is feeling? Holy cow. I mean, his anger must just be swelling up inside of him. This woman with no name has been restored and given life. It's all he wants for his little girl. And now people are coming to him and saying, we're sorry, it's too late. She's dead. And dead is dead. Dead is the absence of life. Carolyn. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, John, the brother of James. When they came to Stop. the house... Now what do you know? What's Jesus say to him? Believe. believe. Have faith. Just believe. She is not dead. She's just asleep. Have faith. Believe. And then they move on. Now... I don't know about you, again, but I want you to imagine what Jairus is going through, right? Can you imagine what's going on in his head now? I mean, dead is dead. Dead is the absence of life. People he knows have come to him and said, your daughter's dead. The grief, the anger, everything he must be feeling, and now this Jesus, who he just witnessed some sort of weird miracle thing in the midst of a crowd, who this Jesus is taking way too long to get to his daughter, and the anger he must be feeling at the crowd and at Jesus, and then all of a sudden, we have this Jesus who says, don't be afraid, have faith. How do you wrap your head around that if you're Jairus? How do you understand what is going on? And yet you want to have some faith. My God, is it possible? Could my little girl still be alive? Is there any re real possibility for her? Imagine 
The fact that the grief is swarming through, the anger, and yet, is there hope? Is that even possible? How is that possible? All right, Carolyn. When they came to the house of the leader of the, syn of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. Okay, I want to tell you just a little side story about these, and it's really short. There are people there doing what? Weeping and wailing, right? These are what are known as paid mourners. This indicates to us that people knew that this girl was so sick that she was at the point of death. And the more paid more mourners you had, the more important you were in the community, the more prestige and power you had. So there's this big crowd outside of the house, including these paid mourners who are wailing and beating their breasts and crying and making a scene because the daughter is dead. That's the importance of this man with a name, who is a leader, who just wants his daughter to live. That's his importance. And that lays in juxtaposition to this woman with no name and this little girl. What could be worse than a woman with no name but a little girl with no name, a child with no name. Even this leader who is so important, so prestigious, his daughter, because she's a girl child, is so worthless, we don't have a name for her. She has zero value. Okay. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the, the child's... Stop. So what do we know? What does Jesus say? <laughs> She's not dead. She's asleep. But dead is dead. How can that even be? You know, but Jesus is saying, look, it's okay. Why are you weeping? Quit making such a commotion. I got this. She's not dead. She's just taking a nap. Are you kidding me? Dead is dead. Dead is the absence of life. The woman who bled for 12 years had the absence of life. Jairus, even with his daughter dying, feels as if all life is leaving him. And Jesus takes the little girl by the hand. The child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in there, and the child was. And he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha, come, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and Stop. What do you know? What's he do? Takes her by the hand. He touches her, and this time he touches her person. This is not a him. Jesus, the man, the man figure, the man obviously with a name the cr that the crowds are swarming around. This Jesus walks straight into Jairus' house. He calms everybody down. He walks in where the little girl is, and he touches this worthless little girl with no name. He takes her by the hand, a loving gesture. It's what pastors do when people are dying and hold their hand. Jesus takes her by the hand and he says, Talitha, come. Which means, little girl, get up. How many of you yelled that at your children before? Get up, let's go. Time for church, let's go. Time for school, let's get up, let's go. Talitha, come. Little girl, get up, let's go. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk, walk about. She was 12 years of age. Ah, stop. How old was she? 12. 12. How long did the woman bleed? 12. 12. 12 years. For the whole life of this little girl, this woman over here was bleeding and couldn't have a baby. And this little girl, this baby of Jairus, is 12 years old, and she's been healed, and she gets up, and she walks around, and it is time to partay. Because there has been resurrection, and there has been life. And life has been given to this little girl with no name, and life has been given to the woman who was bleeding for 12 years with no name, and life has been given to Jairus, even though he has a name, because there is nothing more important to parents than their babies. 
and he too has been restored and given life through this no-name little girl. All right, finish up the scripture, Carolyn. At, <clears throat> at this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Here ends the reading. Thank you. And there is the reading. We have this beautiful story before us today. A reminder of the times in which maybe we think that we are worthless, that we don't matter, that nobody even knows who we are, that we are nameless, or that our pain and our suffering is too great, that nobody pays attention, that nobody cares anymore, that nobody is even gathering at our house. And yet Jesus comes to us. And Jesus gives us all life. Life. No matter who you are, whether you think you're important or you don't even bother to matter to any soul on this earth, Jesus comes to all of you. All of you. You are not forgotten. You are included, whether you are male or female, child or adult, rich or poor. Jesus has come to all of us, to all of you. And he gives you life, life everlasting. Amen. our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. Let us pray. God of hope, the ministry of your church extends across borders from nearby neighbors to far and distant countries. Accompany all those who labor eagerly in service of the gospel, that through your good news all might experience transformation and new life. 
Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, we give you thanks for the air we breathe, the water we drink, the land that provides our food. Guard all species of plants and animals from harsh changes in climate and empower us to protect all that you have made. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Righteous God, we pray for nations and their leaders. Give them a spirit of compassion and steer them towards a fair distribution of resources, that none among us would have too much or too little. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of healing, your touch has the power to make us whole. We pray for those suffering from physical or mental illness. Embrace those who are sick. We lift up especially to you today, Mariah, Jim and Jane, Lorraine, David, Jerry, Arlen, Mary, Carol, Florence, and all those we name in the silence of our hearts. Surround them with your unwavering presence. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for this assembly and all those gathered together in worship. Revive our spirits, renew our relationships, and rekindle our faith that we might experience resurrection in this community. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We give thanks for the faithful ancestors in every age whose lives have pointed us towards you. Envelop them in your love that we may be reunited with one another in the last days. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. The Lord be with you. he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At this time, I would invite you to take your communion sets, and if you run your finger across the top, you'll peel that cellophane. If you peel that back, you will get to the wafer. And those of you at home, if you would take your cracker or bread, and eat of it, all of you, for this is the body of Christ broken for you. And then if you snap the little tab back and peel back, you'll get to the juice. And those of you at home, if you would take your wine or juice and drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of Christ shed for you.
may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.